Amen, amen. Again, you should have a handout this time called Foolish Virgins. Foolish Virgins should be a handout in your position at this time. And we're going to be looking at some of these quotations as we examine the 25th chapter of the book of Matthew. Let's turn there quickly. Matthew 25. Matthew's 25th chapter as we study the topic of the wise and foolish virgins of Matthew 25. Those of you that are listening to this for the first time, I pray that you have an understanding of this chapter and these chapters, I'll say. But we're going to give a short overview, a synopsis of what we're seeing here in the 25th chapter of Matthew. We've studied this previously and we pray that if you go back and look at some of our videos on YouTube, there are a number of videos that will give you some, some idea of this fifth 25th chapter of Matthew and some of the, the principles behind it. But we want to share something just as we get ready to go into our handout and study some scriptures. The 25th and 24th chapter of Matthew go together. Especially for those taking notes, this may be helpful to you. The 25th and the 24th chapter, or we say the 24th and 25th, however you want to put it, they go together. They give us a time frame in which to understand when these things shall come to pass. When we look at the 25th chapter of Matthew, we see this idea of a parable given to explain the kingdom of God. That parable concerning the kingdom of God is time specific. It's dealing with the end of time, yes, but even there's a certain time where these things become applicable and the game will be seen at the end of time. What do I mean by that? In the 24th chapter of Matthew, do we see prophecy? Yes. Do we see the Lord giving prophecy, dealing with the idea of no man deceiving you, and then unfolding prophetic events all the way to the end of time? Is that what the 24th chapter does? Amen. Amen. The 24th chapter gives us this understanding. Yet when we look at the 25th chapter of Matthew, sorry, 24th chapter of Matthew, you have to understand when we look at this 24th chapter, there are some things that take place in this 24th chapter that gives us, <clears throat> in the prophetic stream of time, an idea of when these things will truly come to pass. Many prophecies are progressive and are expansive. In other words, they're like 1 Thessalonians tells us. 1 Thessalonians tells us that the prophetic events, and we look at this in a moment, Prophetic events, according to 1 Thessalonians 5, are like a woman travailing in labor to be delivered. A woman travailing in labor, or a pregnant woman having labor pains about to give birth, she doesn't have a sharp pain, then the baby comes, does she? No. She has a series of pains, similar pains, in similar places, correct, that get more frequent, are you still with me? Amen. More frequent and more intense until that which these, these signs are foretelling takes place. Still with me? Amen. If God likens the prophetic events or the signs of the time under this, it means that many of these prophetic events will repeat themselves. They'll repeat themselves specifically and generally in the same way, not just throughout the body of a woman, but through the time the church exists upon the earth. Until those signs that have happened, people say, oh, there's always been earthquakes. Yes, because they like a woman's labor pains. And they will be seen in the body of Christ with greater intensity and with greater frequency. And by the intensity and frequency, we can tell how close we are to the coming of the Lord. Amen. Are you still with me? Amen. These things are given in the Bible so that we can understand that when someone like a scoffer comes and says, Oh, there's always been earthquake, there's always been famine, there's always been war. We can say, Amen. But the frequency and intensity seen in the 21st century is unparalleled, showing that the coming of the Lord draweth nigh. The frequency and intensity we see in our day was not seen in Ellen White's day. The magnitude and close proximity of earthquakes that was not seen in Ellen White's day. They were growing more and more. They were swelling more and more, just like the loud cry was swelling to a loud cry at the end. Frequency and intensity. Are you still with me? Amen. But there are certain signs that are not necessarily to deal with frequency and intensity that are time cues that show us when these principles of the 24th chapter of Matthew would come to pass and gives a time frame in which the 25th chapter of Matthew is present truth. The 25th chapter of Matthew was not present truth in the time of Luther. Luther lived after Christ gave these messages in Matthew 25 and 24. But these messages were not present truth in Luther's day or Wycliffe's day. They weren't present truth in Christ's day per se because these things will be fulfilled in the future. How do we know that? In Matthew 24, let's look at something very quickly. Matthew, the 24th chapter. Let's look at just a few things that give us an understanding of what time frame in which we are to look and see these things take place and this body, this body of believers to be developed spiritually. Still together, right? Amen. I haven't lost you. Okay, Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, notice what it says in verse 29. Matthew 24 and verse 29. Are we there? 
Amen. Verse 29 says, immediately at the tribulation of those days. In other words, some things were happening before, but immediately something happens. It says in verse 29, shall the sun be darkened, number one, right? Amen. And the moon shall not give her light, number two, right? And the stars shall fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Do we understand that these events took place at a certain time? Do we see the same events that we saw seen in Matthew 24 in the 6th chapter of Revelation? In connection with a great earthquake? Yes? Do we see the same idea mentioned by Joel and other prophets? Even to the specificity that will even say that the sun will go down at noon. Exactly as it took place. And we know these things took place at a certain time. At the ending of the 1700s, going into the 1800s, right? Leading up to, especially 1833, with the great style shower that was recorded by Abraham Lincoln, right? right? I mean, these things were recorded by people that lived at that time. Abraham Lincoln recorded in his memoirs. We also see that uh, the great abolitionist speaker, uh, Frederick Douglass, in his book, talked about this event. People saw this. It took place. But these things, as they happened, were showing us that the time when these things would become present truth and applicable are here. Star shower, right? Sun and moon changing, one going dark, one going like blood. Joel speaks of it, right? Revelation, John speaks of it. All this is showing us a time frame when these things will be present truth and when we can look for the coming of the Lord drawing nigh. Now, we could say that's 200 years ago, but yes, when we look at these, these understandings, we see that at this time, God is going to raise up a people to do a specific work. And in the raising of these people, when we look at the 24th chapter of Matthew, once we have this understanding, the 24th chapter of Matthew gives us an understanding of what's going to happen to those people as they develop. Matthew 24 talks about the parable of the fig tree, right? It talks about the time of Noah, Amen. It talks about how those times will be repeated. We can tell when the Lord is coming because of the fig tree, because of what happened in the time of Noah. It goes on and talks about other things and shows us what's going to happen to those people develop when these signs are fulfilled. Are you still with me? Amen. But when it gives us this understanding, remember the chapter divisions are put there by man. There's no chapter division in the scrolls. When God gives all this understanding, when we come to what we see as the 25th chapter, it says something, it just starts with a word that gives us understanding that what we just saw is a time period where it becomes present truth and these things are applicable. It says that that period is the period in which this prophecy or this parable is present truth. It begins with a word called then. Then. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto. When is then? When these events, when these star showers take place, when the sun and moon, when these things happen, God is drawing together the people that's going to liken unto ten virgins. If you read the book Great Controversy, you've seen the book Great Controversy, that there was great application to this prophecy in the midnight cry. The idea of going out to meet the bridegroom was often the imagery used by the great Advent preachers. And the great Advent movement saw themselves in this prophecy because they believed that they had seen prophecy being unfolded by the great earthquake in Lisbon, by the star shower, by the sun turning to darkness and the moon becoming blood the same day. All these things showed that the coming of the Lord was nigh and they saw the 23 day prophecy and as they looked at all these things, they saw that this generation was now going to see the fulfillment of these passages here. And even though they believed that, it seems like they forgot that the Bible says that there would be a delay. What time are we living in now? The time of that delay. Because even though we look at an application in the 1840s of a delay and so on, before 1844, and the idea of going in to meet him, there is an application, a great application at the end of time. I'm going to read that in just a moment. But when we look at this passage, there's some things in the 25th chapter of Matthew that we seem to not really grasp as God's people. They're living under the time when the prophecy to be fulfilled, even with great intensity and frequency, all the way down to the coming of the bridegroom. We seem to not study this chapter and see it as applicable to us and specifically dealing with issues that will be obscene among us and used as a template to not be discouraged when we see discouraging situations around us ecclesiastically, 
socially. We can understand that we have been given a work and a mission and a role as salt in the earth and to take up our work and do it according to the word of God. Not being dismayed by what other people are doing. Though their name may be on the church, we're not going to be concerned with that. We're going to say what we need to say and do what we need to do. Sigh and cry. Are you still with me? Amen. When we look at this understanding, we get a great understanding of how God is encouraging us to, at this time, prepare to wake up. Because the Bible says, all slumbered and slept. Let's read some of this and just get some of the imagery so we can get it in our mind before we look at something. In Matthew 25, verse 1, it says this. Matthew 25, 1, it says, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto the ten virgins, which took their what? Lamps. Lamps. And went forth to meet the? Bridegroom. The Bible says they were virgins or women, right? Amen. These were women that were going to marry a bridegroom, a man. So these were, it's not our day, it was men with men and women with women. These were women going into a bride party, right? And these women, Jeremiah 6, 2, Isaiah 51 tells us, a woman in Bible prophecy represents a? Church. church. Or as these ten... Ten is completion. Represents God's people that were assembled at this time to go in with him into a spiritual experience to hear the Advent message because the Bible says, Behold the bridegroom cometh. Behold, Christ the bridegroom cometh. Now Christ is the bridegroom, right? Amen. Remember when the, the disciples of John came to him and said, Hey, why don't your disciples fast? He said, Can the children of the bridegroom fast? When they had the bridegroom with them? Amen. Jesus said he was the bridegroom. So we understand this idea, the bridegroom cometh, is the coming of Christ, an Advent message. Gather these people together. And it says here, it says they went and took their lamps and went forth to meet their bridegroom. What is a lamp in prophecy, prophetically? Word Thy what? Who can quote it? Thy word, Thy word is a? A? Bible, right? We know these texts. We studied those in Sabbath school when we were two and three years old, right? We know what the lamp is. These all had a Bible, right? And they all had a message. They gathered them together, right? And they all went to meet the bridegroom, right? They all had a similar experience of some sort. And they all made profession of being a part of this great Advent movement. And with one Bible, one message, going out. But it says this in verse 2. And five of them were wise. And five of them were... Now some of us think that we can discern between the two easily. But we'll see that in a minute. Let's, hold on a minute. Five were wise. Five were foolish. How do we discern the difference between? It says in verse 3, They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. Now what's the lamp represent? The Word of God. So all had their Bible, the wise and the foolish. Amen? Amen. All had the Scriptures. But it said that the foolish, verse 3, foolish, took no oil with them. They had oil in their lamp at some time, which caused them to go out and experience but they didn't take any oil with them for the journey. What is this oil? Let's hold our finger there in the book of Matthew 25. For those that may not know, look at a few chapters back. Look at the book of Zechariah. Zechariah's fourth chapter. Zechariah 4. What is this oil that they failed to take with them? That they possessed because the oil being lit, that lamp being lit, seeing through the darkness to go, and go to the bridegroom's house. And by the way, brothers and sisters, if you're not familiar with the Oriental culture, when I was in Japan, I was surprised to find out that even to this day, traditional Japanese wedding or Oriental weddings take place in the night. At night. It's the Oriental custom. See, the Western custom is to do it during, you know, noontime or early in the morning. Of course, the way most brides get ready usually does take place in the night. They didn't, they didn't get that. But it's supposed to, in the Oriental custom, take place at the night where there may be a need of, in just in the secular sense, need of light to get to the desired location. When we look at the book of Zechariah, what is this oil that is in the lamp which gives light so that there can be a, a visibility of the direction that you're going in? What does this oil represent? In the book of Zechariah chapter 4, Zechariah 4 and verse 6, the Bible says this. Zechariah 4 and verse 6 says, then he answered and spake unto me, saying, Thus is, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might, nor by power, but by my what? Spirit, Spirit saith the... And what was he seeing that caused him to say, This is the power of God and his Spirit? Verse 3. Two olive trees, by it, one upon the right side of the bowl, and the other upon the left side of the bowl. So I answered and spake unto the angel, and he talked with me, saying, What are these my... Lord, what was he seeing? 
olive trees and bowls, verse 3 and 2 and 1, talks about these two olive trees, two candlesticks, and there was olive oil going through pipes into these things and causing light to shine forth. What are these, my Lord? It is the Spirit of the Lord. The Spirit of the Lord. Let's take our hand out. Wait, look, hold your finger in Matthew 25. Come back to Matthew 25. Let's look at our hand out. Do we have that? Christ Object Lesson, page 408. Christ Object Lesson, C-O-L, page 408. It says, in the parable, all the ten virgins went out to meet the bridegroom. All had lamps and vessels for oil. For a time there was seen no difference between them. So with the church that lives just before Christ's second coming, all have a knowledge of the scriptures. Right? Amen. All have heard the message of Christ's near approach and confidently expect His appearing. But as in the parable, so it is now. A time of waiting intervenes, faith is tried, and when the cry is heard, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, many are what? Already. They have no oil in their vessels. With their lamps, they are what? Even with the King James Version. They're destitute of the Holy Spirit. Now, brothers and sisters, when we understand this, this divine truth, please do not let the idea escape on you that even though five were wise and five were foolish, and one did not take oil for the vessels in the vessels for the long period of delay or for contingency, and one did, there was a similar situation that took place upon all of them that's significant for our study today. Very significant for our study today. When we look at this idea that something took place to them, we want to make sure that you understand. When we look at this parable, it says this. Let's read it. Matthew 25. In verse 4, it says, But the wise, Matthew 25, 4, But the wise took oil in their vessel with their lamp. But while the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Five were wise, right? Amen. Five were foolish. But how many slumbered and slept? All. all. One had oil for contingency and for delay. One took no oil. But all did what? Slumbered and slept. When we look at the Word of God, they all had a Bible. They all had a message or a knowledge of God's coming, but they all also slumbered and slept. When did they slumber and sleep? Let's again read it. Okay, let's look what it says. Verse 5. While the bridegroom, what? Tarried, they all slumbered and slept. And at midnight, the darkest hour, right? There was a cry made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him. Then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. There was a message that called the people during that time, during this Advent time, during the time of these signs. Some people were alive that still remember seeing some of these signs that gave the Advent message. And they heard this message, and they all went out to meet the bridegroom and make preparation. Their lamps shone with great brightness and called others to join the bridal party. But of that group, some were wise and some were foolish. Now the Bible says, while the bridegroom tarried, there's a period of tarrying where there was time that passed over this body in the night, and during this night time, because there was a need of trimming the lamps, trimming the lamps means the lamps went out. During the time of tarrying, someone's lamp went out. During this time of tarrying, some light continued to burn because they had oil. During the time of tarrying, though some had lamps that were truly burning by the power of the Holy Spirit, and some were destitute of the Holy Spirit, all were slumbering and sleeping until right before the bridegroom is about to make his appearance, a cry again, similar to the first one, takes place in the church and wakes everyone up. A, 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 a occurrence, something happens prophetically that wakes everyone up and now, though probably before it was not easily discernible, what was in the vessel, because you had the lamp and you had oil in the vessel, what was in the vessel now becomes apparent. The Bible says, for God to command the light to shine out of darkness has shone into our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure in earthen vessels. That the excellency of the power may be of God and not of us. Where is that? You see why we sing these songs? It's not to be cute. It's to put these things in your mind because these things will help you in a time of trouble. 
from the smallest child, they can remember these songs. We have this treasure, this glory of God, this Holy Spirit, this experience in earthen vessels. So they had this oil in their vessels with their lamps. They had an experience that called the Bible to be a true guide unto them. But when were they able to truly see the difference between these two groups? At the second cry, this issue, right at the, this prophetic event at the end of time. But brothers and sisters, we can't ignore the fact that during this tarrying time, all slumbered and slept. The wise too? Yes, the wise too. Me? Yes, you. You too? Amen. All slumbered and slept. When we understand, in, in, in the midst of all that we're studying this morning, when we understand what this sleep is, it gives us understanding of the importance of us truly letting the scriptures cause us to allow our light to shine despite the condition that we're in. To attain to this spiritual power seen by the oil and to keep it in our lamps that we don't run out. To allow the word of God to read. Now if you read Christ's object lesson and write this chapter in the spirit of prophecy, you've seen some amazing things. And this is just a repeat to you. This is not really showing you anything that you don't already know. But many don't seem to understand the parable and how it really speaks to us, especially this idea of slumbering and sleeping. There are three main ways. Three main ways. Now there may be 17 but as far as I can see, with my own limited understanding, humbly sharing some things with you this morning, there's only three main ways that I've seen in the scriptures, and again, I could be wrong, but I've only seen three main ways that God expresses in a prophetic sense, sleep. And these three ways are applicable to what we see in Matthew 25. Because all these three instances of sleep have the application to the people that were part of the great advent movement and founded this people that we see the ten virgins at that time and that are even now still in this period of delay or tarrying that at the midnight cry there'll be a people that wake up. When we read the book in Christ, Christ I listen and we see this chapter we understand that those that were giving this message at the first cry are not necessarily the people that are giving it at the last cry, per se, yet it's one church, right? The church of God is, is expansive. It goes through all, all time. And the great number of God's saints are now under the first application of sleep. Now, if you're taking notes, let's look at the Hold Matthew 25. We're coming back. Look at the book of John. John 11. Let's see what the first application of sleep is that applies to this passage. In the book of John, chapter 11, it says this. Oh, brother and sister, I hope you're following along because we're going to see how important this is in just a moment. I know you've probably not seen a message in this format, but we're going to see this very, very clearly in a moment, prayerfully by God's grace. John 11, there are three main applications of sleep, and these three applications apply to how God's Adventist people have in this day and age been all, whether wise or foolish, been asleep. Let's examine that. In John 11, it says this, John 11 John, number one, sleep also refers to death. Literal, literal death. In John 11 and verse, it's, uh, John 11 and verse 11, it says this. John 11, 11. It says, these things said he, and after that he said unto them, our friend Lazarus does what? Sleepeth. Sleepeth. But I go that I may awake him out of sleep. Then said his disciples, Lord, if he sleep, he shall do well. You know, even today, there's people in the church that think that sleeping is not a big thing. Oh, the church is asleep, but hey, you know what? We're, we're fine. We're rich and increased with good. Don't worry about it. Focus on the good. Here the disciples say, hey, you know what? If the church is asleep, no problem. God said it. I don't have any problem with that. We're going on. Verse 13. How be it Jesus spake of his death, but they thought that he had spoken of taking rest in sleep. Even the church at this time did not have a clear understanding of the prophetic or even spiritual meaning of sleep. Verse 14. Then said Jesus unto them plainly, Lazarus is dead. First application, what? In the book Christ's Object Lessons, if you read all of it, because we didn't give every quote there, Christ's Object Lesson says that many that gave this Advent message at the beginning in the 1800, and faithfully let their light shine that men may see their good works, that their light, even though they're fallen in the death of sleep, their light still shines 
pointing the way to the Father's house. The book Great Controversy is a light that even though she's sleeping in the grave, she's still pointing the way to the Father's house. Jan Andrews. He has fallen asleep, one of the first pioneers to die. He has fallen asleep, but his books are still pointing a light into the bride chamber. S. N. Haskell, John Loughborough, we go on and on. All these individuals, their books are still lighting the way to the Father's house. But where are they right now? They're asleep. They have fallen asleep in death. Now we're told in the book Early Rhymes, and it's not in your notes, but in the book Early Rhymes, we're told that those that died in the faith of Thurney's message, keeping the Sabbath, will come up in the special resurrection. So even though they have fallen asleep, guess what's going to happen at the very end? You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. Second application. We, we can't go back. We, see, we can't go back. We have to keep going forward. We can't go back. Think about it. Second application. Number one, death. Number two, a lack of prophetic discernment. What's another application of sleep? A lack of prophetic discernment. Look at the book of 1 Thessalonians quickly. 1 Thessalonians. All did what? So did everyone die? Well, basically, yes. Who at that time is alive today? They all slumbered and slept, right? However, their light caused many others to come into the bridegroom party, as it were. And there's some today that still have light shining. Are you with me? Yes. The original people of all slumbered and did what? Yes. Slept. Both wise and foolish have mercy. That's chilling to think about that. Wise and foolish, they all slumbered and slept. Yet, when we talk about this application, there are other people that came into the faith and understanding because of their light or their lamps, as it were. Their understanding, their messages. And those people also are still there. And even though they're alive, they're not spiritually, or sorry, they're not dead in a prophetic sense. They're alive. They're alive and remain, as it were. These other two applications apply to them. Did you get that? Amen. All that body, Ellen White, James White, even William Miller, all these people that had a part in the early work, they all are what, doing what right now? Sleeping. Slumbering and sleeping. Until the master calls them, right? Amen. But there were others that came in and heard the message, and that, sw that crowd swelled, and there's some that are alive today, and they have still some, some today, both wise and foolish now, because ever since that time, when all those signs took place, the church is represented by wise and foolish. Wise and foolish. Remember when that vote was just taken to the general conference? What was the vote? It was like 40 something percent for women's ordination. It was almost 50 percent. Half wise, half foolish. When we look at the work of God, there are people alive today and the people alive today that are not of that first group that all slumbering and sleeping in the grave. These people are wise and foolish. These people are not represented by death because they're alive. And they're represented in these two other applications of death. So we see exactly why we're in the condition that we're in today and why God is trying to do a work of revival and reformation and the cry will soon be made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. We're looking for 1 Thessalonians, are we not? 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And we're going to begin with verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And verse 1. Say amen if you have that. Amen. Okay, just wait for me because I'm trying to get there. First Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 1. Amen. But other times, are we there? Amen. But of times and seasons, brethren, ye have no need that I write unto you, the brethren of the people of God, right? Ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly, or the brethren do, that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the... For when they shall say peace and safety, then sudden destruction come upon them, listen to this, as travail upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Verse 4, but ye brethren are not in darkness that that day should come upon you or overtake you as a thief. Ye are all children of the, what? Light. 2 Peter 1.19 says prophecy is a light, is it not? Amen. That shines in the dark place to the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts. Ye, I said brethren, are children of light and children of the day. We are not the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not, what is it? Sleep as others do, but let us watch and be. Sober. Paul said, some are sleeping and some are sleeping. Let's make this go on. It said, for they that sleep, verse 7, sleep in the night. And they that be drunken are drunken in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober. 
I mean, the way. Putting, upon, putting on the what? Faith. Of faith and love, and for a helmet, the hope of salvation. For God has appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Sleep, in this passage, is denoted as not discerning the prophetic times. Not seeing or having spiritual discernment of the prophetic times. They were sleeping, even in the night. Brothers and sisters, could it be that even with all our understanding and all our zeal and our sincerity, we're sleeping? We don't really perceive the true import the scriptures are giving us? The pen observation says that the discernment of how someone is spiritually, it says to see if someone's really been carved out of the world by the mighty cleaver of truth is how they deal with health reform. Their understanding and their acceptance of health reform is an indicator, she says, of their, they're really being carved out by the mighty cleaver of truth. And she said the mighty cleaver of truth is a three-inch message. How they react, with, are they, well, okay. Oh, dress it for them, okay. Uh, well, you know, we'll eat some vegetables. You know, it's, it's, let's not get too fanatical about this stuff. The discernment, the discernment of where one is, health reform, she says, is a part of it. Dress reform, she says, is a part of it. The fruit of the Spirit, the character. Because again, that oil represents the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit represents what? Okay, you don't know. Look what it says in Christ's Opulence. The second paragraph. Christ's Opulence, page 411. What does this oil represent? Christ's Opulence, page 411. COL 4.11 says, no man can receive the Spirit for another. Amen? Amen? No man can receive the Spirit for another. No man can impart to another the character which is the fruit of the Spirit's working. Now, do you know? The character which is the fruit of the Spirit's working. Though Noah, Daniel, and Job were in it, meaning the Lamb, as I live, saith the Lord God, they shall deliver neither son nor daughter, but they shall deliver their own souls by their righteousness. Christ, I've lesson page 411. What does this oil represent? Just the Holy Spirit? Character. Even the development of character necessary to enter in with the bridegroom. So when we're talking about this experience or this oil, it's also represented even in a tarrying time of the possession of, what's that word? Character. Possession of what? Character. In the 14th chapter of Revelation, this, I know we're, we're going to move number two, but let's, let's, let me give you a text. In the 14th chapter of Revelation, those that died, those that are sleeping in the grave, that had that character because of the oil and because of the word, because of the message, because they died, they can't enter into the kingdom of God, right? Because they died, there's, there's no more hope for them, right? No. They, they, they most certainly, because that death does not keep them. Even though they slumbered and slept, notice what it says in Revelation 14. Revelation 14 says this. The 14th chapter of Revelation. Revelation 14. And Revelation 14 and verse 12, it says, Here is the patience of the saints. Say amen if you have that. Amen. Revelation 14, 12 says, Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and the faith of Jesus. And we found that when we talk about that here, some of those that are here are there in the grave. Here are the pain of the saints. Where are they? Well, it's a lot of them in the grave. Well, what about them? Look at verse 4, 13. 13 says, And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are they that die in the Lord. So, uh, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, and their works do follow them. They won't lose their reward in any wise. They all slumber and sleep. But their labors may be ended in a sense for this tarrying time, but their works do follow them. The 11th chapter of Revelation said God will give people's works unto his servants rewards. Oh, brothers and sisters. Some are sleeping in the grave. In our generation, among us that are alive, we don't possess a true understanding. If we really understood, if we really had a true understanding of the prophetic situation, we would be so evangelistic. We'd be so spiritual minded. We'd be so active for God in various ways. We'd be all encompassed. You say, oh, let the pastor do this. No, brothers and sisters, we all would be, Moses said, what to God that all of God's people would prophesy. 
and then he would pour his spirit upon them. That's what the whole idea of the sealing work or this Advent message is, that all the world would feel and experience the power of God, that all would be called to prophesy. The book of Joel said he'll pour his spirit upon what? Oh. All flesh. One writer said all flesh prepared to receive it in early and latter rain power. God desired that all would receive this gift. But brothers and sisters, we're not truly understanding the prophetic time that we're in. And the degree that we, that we understand it is the degree which we see revival information. We're told that when we study the books of Daniel and Revelation correctly, that we see a revival among God's people. Over and over again, she talks about this idea of receiving a knowledge of God's truth, receiving a knowledge of the three in his message, studying Daniel Revelation, these things, especially even Daniel 11, these things were called revival and reformation. They would, they would seem to cause us to see where we are and to be wide awake spiritually. Amen. Number two is lacking discernment, even prophetic discernment. Number three. You can write down your wrote notes, Isaiah also, Isaiah 56.10. Isaiah 56.10 talks about those greedy dogs that like to slumber and sleep. The watchmen that can't give the message. They love to slumber and sleep. They can't bark and they can't seem to stop sleeping. They can't discern the sign of the times to give the present truth. That's Isaiah 56. It's not just a rebuke saying someone's a dog. The symbol shows that these people are unable to give the message. They're unable to cease from their sleeping. They're unable to give present truth prophetic messages. They are unable to do so. It's who they are. They must be transformed. Isaiah 56 and verse 10. Number three. Hope we're still together. Hope we're still together. I can't tell. Number three. We talked about number one, death. Literal death, right? Dying. Going to the grave. Number two. Lacking spiritual discernment when it comes to the prophecies. Lacking prophetic discernment. Number three is again a lack of spiritual discernment. But this lack of spiritual discernment is dealing with the introduction of error. It's one thing to not really see in its true import the prophetic things that we are seeing in the three news message. Not really understand the need of reforms. Not really understand the gospel. Not really understand what the judgment hour is. It's one thing not to really see these things and see them in such a way that it causes us to completely be changed in life and to do the will of God from an enlightened spiritual conscience. That's one thing. But when we talk about this idea, the third idea, the third principle of sleep, the Bible teaches that another aspect of sleep is that we do not have the spiritual discernment as to the introduction of error. Spiritual discernment, the introduction of error. In other words, errors or iniquity can abound, and rather than being able to easily discern it, it seems as if we don't have the, the ability. We, we seem to lose that ability, just as some in nighttime seem to lose consciousness. When you're sleeping, do you know what's going on around you? When you're sleeping, because someone could take your wallet and you would not know. You wake in the morning, where's my wallet? The person was right there, hammering right in your pocket. But you were completely insensible to this theft, right? Sleep, this idea of sleep also represents not being able to discern in a spiritual sense the introduction of error. One of the greatest ways we see that is in Jesus' parable. In Matthew 13, or hold on, I think in Matthew 25, but in the 13th chapter of Matthew, Jesus gave a parable. And notice what it says here. Matthew 13. Matthew, the 13th chapter. Matthew 13 and verse 24. See if you're familiar with this passage. Matthew 13, 24, it says this, Another parable put he forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is likened unto a man which sowed good seed in his field. Ever heard that parable before? Amen. But while men, what's the next word? Slept. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed what? Amen. Tears among the wheat and went his way. But when the blade was sprung up and brought forth fruit, then appeared the tears also. Familiar with that passage? The introduction in this rich farm or this rich land of wheat of false principles or false believers is denoted in the parable under the reality, even though a spiritual parable, the reality that the individuals that were over this farm, over this vast tract of land, were doing what? They were insensible to the introduction of error. 
They were insensible to introduction. And we know that the word of God teaches over and over again. What was Samson doing when his hair was cut? Sleep. That's the book of Judges 16. Sleeping on the knees of an impure woman. He told, oh, weave my hair. Oh, put the... That last time, he didn't want to expect that, was he? He was insensible. And Ellen White says, as she cut, he was so deep asleep. She, he cut off the, the big, because he had massive hair. He had seven huge braids. And these large, she says, massive uh, shards of hair fell to the ground, and he was insensible to what was going on. He was insensible that he was being dispossessed of something that symbolized spiritual truth. Remember 1 Samuel? Saul was in that ditch or that trench sleeping, and he had a spear and his crews of water. Now, a spear, of course, represents the word of God, just like a sword does. And the water, of course, represents the spirit. And he put his spear down and his water and fell asleep. Now, the Bible says, if the blind lead the blind, the king of Israel was down in the ditch, sleeping. And he took the Bible and he took the spirit down inside there. And what did David come and do? He said, you won't need this. And when he woke up, where's my spirit? Where is my water? Allegory? He was insensible to the introduction of error or the removal of the landmarks. The removal of Bible truth. The removal from our worship services and our preaching and our ability to communicate the word of spiritual power. Oh, that was a good message. What did he talk about? Well, you know, he talked about his trip to Europe and <laughs> his kids graduating from high school and oh, something about the church barbecue coming up. And oh, I tell you, we had a good time. I saw brother so-and-so. I saw so, so he talked about, yeah, but you know, I really saw a lot of people. The substitution in the church of the Word of God and the Spirit of God in our services is hard to discern when you're sleeping in the ditch. When you've been led there by blind guides, not able to discern the removal of the landmarks, the removal of the Spirit from certain congregations or bodies of people. Now to discern where we truly are as a people. Death, not understanding the prophetic sign and where we are prophetically as a people and their import upon us and also not sensible, seemingly spiritually insensible to both the introduction of error as well as the removal of those things that are necessary for the spiritual benefit of God's people. Sleep. The Bible says all slumbered and slept. One were not developing any character. Though they had an experience at one time during this, uh, this, this, this outline, though they had an experience at one time, that oil is long gone. And their light went out in dark, and they were sleeping in the night, in the dark, and insensible to the fact that their light had gone out, until that cry came, and then they woke up in their own moral darkness. They were sensible of the, this prophetic event, spoken of this parable, called them to see their own moral darkness that surrounded them, and they were able to look and see light had risen upon and was still risen upon the others. And they wanted to go and have the transfer of character so necessary at that time for this prophetic event that had taken place. These people that are, that are not wise, that are foolish, are not hypocrites. There are many people that we see and know today, Lord help, Lord help me, that don't even fit the category of foolish virgins because they're hypocrites. The foolish virgins are not hypocrites. They're not acting, they're pretending. They really believe present truth. See, some people are not even are not in this category. Some people are not actually even tares, much less foolish virgins, we try and put everyone, not, you can't put everyone inside there. We tear, uh, I won't go there, I won't go there. Look what it says here, look at your handout. Look at your handout. Oh, I, I, I pray that someone's getting some of this today. Amen. Notice what it says here. Because again, all had their Bible, right? Yes. And all of us have Bible, but guess what? If we're not converted, what does it do for us? Is it helping Satan? No. Yes. His fallen angels? They're not being helped by the Bible. 
Ellen White says that Satan and his fallen angels come to where the minister is studying and he looks over his shoulder. When he turns around, looks at his sermon notes. Oh, is that what that means? I can I cannot understand what that meant. Oh, okay. Okay, get ready. Yeah, get start a war in Bosnia because we yeah, this this says we, yeah, we watch out. What? The Pope the Pope is gonna have, oh they're looking, studying the spirit of prophecy and the Bible, and also seeing where God is raising individuals that are getting spiritual discernment and looking at their notes, seeing, hearing these sermons. She said he's on the ground when sermons are presented. So much so that the Spirit of Prophecy says that God dispatches two angels to stand by the minister that his life is not snuffed out in the message. Keep the building from falling down. It says in Christ's Christ, Opera Lesson, page 408, this. Notice what it says. We need to have an experience. We need to have the Holy Spirit and this character of Christ reproduced in us. Christ, Opera Lesson, page 408, says this. Are you on your hand? A third paragraph. Without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His, of His Word is of no avail. Some people can tell you everything about the history. But guess what? No Spirit. They can tell you everything about all the pioneers. They can do all these variants and charts. But if you disagree with them, Lord have mercy upon your soul. If you don't do what they say, God be merciful unto us sinners. If you don't agree with them and say that they're right, return of the dragon. But they have all this knowledge, right? But the character, the ability to say, have someone disagree with you and say, okay, that's all right. Well, let's pray and see if it's, it's study it out a little bit more. Mm -mm. Who do you think you are? What? Yeah. You know, you, you, you are, you, you, you. Anger. How dwell the Spirit of God in that? Again, without the Spirit of God, a knowledge of His Word is of no avail. The theory of truth, unaccompanied by the Holy Spirit, cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. They could even preach messages, but the messages cannot quicken the soul. It doesn't bring conviction. It can bring fear. Hitler could bring fear, but the conviction that causes one to seek after Christ, the conviction power of the Spirit of God, the clarity, mm -mm. cannot quicken the soul or sanctify the heart. One may be familiar with the commands and promises of the Bible, but unless the Spirit of God sets the truth home, the character will not be transformed. Without the enlightenment of the Spirit, men will not be able to distinguish, there it is, truth from error. They will fall under the masterful temptations of Satan. Mercy. Look at the next one. Again, Christ up the lesson, page 411. The class represented by the foolish virgins are not hypocrites. Bold underline. They have a regard for the truth. They have advocated the truth. They are attracted to those who believe the truth. They look just like me. They talk like me. They dress like me. They can preach to some degree. They're active full of activity, ready to talk about things. Things spiritual, things for profane. Things holy and things divine. Things good and things bad. Things to come, things... To, they're ready to talk about anything, but they can talk about those prophecies. It says, number one, they have not yielded. Number one, they have not yielded themselves to the Holy Spirit's working, though. With all their work. Number two, they have not fallen upon the rock, Christ Jesus, and permitted their own natures to be broken up. The penetration says, if Christ is abiding in us, and we're abiding in Him, then we can't speak angry words. That's a direct quote. If Christ is abiding in us, and we're abiding in Him, we cannot speak angry words. We cannot have those passionate outbursts against people. It's an indication that we have removed that seed. That seed is not still in us. They have not fallen upon the rock, and been broken. This class are represented also by the stony ground hearers. Number three, they receive the word with readiness, but they fail of assimilating its principles. They're on live stream, they subscribe to YouTube, they watch all the videos, its influence is not abiding. The spirit works upon man's heart according to his, number one, or A, desire, and also B, his consent, implanting in him a new nature, but the class represented by, number four, the foolish virgins have been content with a superficial work. The pastor gave me a pound. Oh, oh yeah. Because I'm okay. Oh, he smiled. Oh. Oh, the people think that I'm, I, I dress well. 
Oh, I speak well when I give prayer. Yeah, everyone seems to think that, I, you know, they, they respect my opinion. They're, they're satisfied with a superficial work. Number five, they do not know God. They have not studied his character. Number six, they have not held communion, brothers and sisters, prayer. They have not held communion with him. Therefore, they do not know how to trust, how to look and live. Number seven, their service to God degenerates into a... They're here on Sabbath. They're there on Sabbath. They're doing things. It says, quote, they come unto thee as the people cometh, and they sit before thee as my people, and they hear thy words, but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after covetousness. Christ up in page 411. Brothers and sisters, all slumbered and slept though. When we look at the wise and the foolish, this identifies the foolish, but again, the wise that even had a character and were developing character seemingly did not have the complete understanding of the prophecy that would cause them to be much more wide awake and about our Father's business, to be much more spiritually discerning of the introduction of error among them. The Bible says in the book of Matthew 24, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. Romans 5, 5 says, that hope maketh not ashamed, because the Holy Spirit, the love of God, which is the Holy Spirit, shed abroad in our hearts. This, brothers and sisters, this love is going to wax cold. Do you get that? Romans 5, 5, hope maketh not ashamed. For the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts by the Holy Ghost given unto us. And all the applications of love you may see, the Holy Spirit being poured out according to Romans 5, 5, into our hearts as a true experience, or that oil that we need to develop character and the fruit thereof, this, according to Matthew 24, because of the iniquity abounding or the association and the uh, proximity they have to those that are foolish, unregenerate, tears, whatever you may call them, this is causing the love of many, the spiritual experience, the spiritual discernment of many to wax cold. A direct application to later see is issue because God says that they're not hot or cold. They have been trans. Sent, they've been descending more and more from that hot first experience to a lukewarm experience where they have not really left the church, but they're definitely not serving God. They have not really left the church, but they're not really doing the will of God from the heart. They really don't love the truth. They don't really love study. They don't really hunger and thirst after the word of God as they once did. They've lost this true experience to the point where the Bible says that all God can really do with them is vomit them out in mercy to the world and to the church. But the Bible says, because iniquity shall abound, this love shall wax cold. And because of this experience of the people of God, he doesn't say, hey, I'm going to resurrect you because you're alive. He said, I'm going to give you Isaiah. That you can be able to discern truth from error. You can discern the spiritual condition that you're in and also the signs of the time. I'm going to put some white raiment on you and give you an experience of faith and love applied by gold that you may be able to overcome, repent, and stand with me at the end. Get back to that Philadelphian experience. You know what the word Philadelphia means, right? It means brotherly love. And the Bible says, oh, how good and how pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. It's as the dew of ermine that fell upon the mountain. It was as that oil that was put upon Aaron's head that ran down his beard, even to the skirts of his garment. The oil ran down from Christ, even to the skirts of his garment, even to the upper room upon the earth from heaven. And the brethren were united in unity by the Holy Ghost power, by early rain power, type of the latter rain. This is the experience that we need when the bridegroom's message comes to us again. We must be preparing with character development now. But brothers and sisters, where are we? Where are we as a people? Mm, Lord have mercy upon us. Christ up in lesson page 413. Christ up in lesson page 413. All slumber and slept, brothers and sisters. We need that eye salve. Because we would be much more spiritually awake if we had eye salve. All slumber and slept, but we don't see the introduction of error in the way that God would have because we've seen that we're insensible. We're slumbering and sleeping. And while we're sleeping, the Satan is stealing a march upon us. Some of us were much more spiritual years ago. Some of us had greater spiritual power. 
Some of us had greater ability to explain the scripture and give it with power. Some of us would, would give messages and, and plead for people. We stay up and pray for people. But we Facebooked it out. We Instagrammed it away. We Netflixed it all the way into some other. We, we have more to fear from within, brothers and sisters, than from without. Christ, let's page 4.13 says, We cannot be ready to meet the Lord by waking when the cry is heard. Behold the bridegroom. We can't do that. And then gathering about empty lamps to have them replenished. Mm -mm. We cannot keep Christ apart from our lives here and yet be fitted for his companionship in heaven. We can't do that. This is because the church in general thinks that this latest in condition and this, this oilless condition is to be proffered or to be applauded. That's only making the love of many wax cold. It's not God's idea. God says we do not know, Lady Cedar does not know its own true condition. That's why they believe they're rich and increased with good, and God said we're wretched, miserable, and naked. There's a dichotomy, there's a difference there between God's view and our view. Spiritual discernment of those that are not sleeping in the grave. It says this Christ of the Lesson, page 418. COF 418. But no man can impart that which he himself has not received. I read it again. But no man can impart that which he himself has not received. In the work of God, humanity can originate nothing. No man can, by his own effort, make himself a light bearer for God. It was the golden oil emptied by the heavenly messengers into the golden tubes to be communicated or conducted from the golden bowl into the lamps of the sanctuary that produced a continual bright and shining light. It is the love of God continually transferred to man that enables him to impart light into the hearts of all who are united to God by faith and the golden oil of love flows freely to shine out again in good works and real heartfelt service to God. Amen. Amen. But in this condition, the cry comes. While some were getting involved in activities in the church and some were really understanding the principles of the church and accepting them and walking in them and sharing them, the cry comes. Behold the bridegroom coming. Notice what it says. Christ up lesson page 412. COL 412. It is in the crisis that character is revealed. When is character revealed? Crisis. crisis. Let someone come inside and start shooting and we'll see really who is strong like David. When the earnest voice proclaimed at midnight, Behold the bridegroom cometh, go ye out to meet him, and the sleeping virgins were aroused from their slumbers, both wise and foolish, it was seen who had made preparation for the event. Both parties were taken unawares. But one was prepared for the emergency and the other was found without preparation. So now a sudden unlooked for. So now, we're talking about our day now, a sudden unlooked for calamity. Something that brings the soul face to face with death will show whether there's any real faith in the promises of God. What could that be? What calamity is about to happen to come upon us? that will bring our soul, every soul face to face with death, that will show truly if we have any faith in the promise of God. It says, it will show whether the soul is sustained by grace. The great final test comes at the close of human probation, when it shall be too late for the soul's need to be supplied. What's the soul's need? That developed character. A great event. Great Controversy 605 says this, Great Controversy 605. The Sabbath will be the great test of loyalty for the point of truth specially controverted. When the final test shall be brought to bear upon men and the line of distinction shall be drawn between those who serve God and those who serve Him not, while the observance of the formal Sabbath in compliance with the law of the state, contrary to the fourth commandment, will be an avowal of allegiance to a power that is in opposition to God, the keeping of the true Sabbath in obedience to God's law is an evidence of loyalty to the Creator. When one class, by accepting the sign of submission to earthly powers, received the mark of the beast, the other choosing the token of allegiance to divine authority received the seal of God. By death decree, this would be a calamity that brings the soul face to face with death. What's the cry at midnight? Behold the bridegroom coming? Oh, when that, when that takes place, everyone knows Jesus is about to come then. Everyone's going to be scrambling. Oh, oh, let's, let's, get, oh let's, let's get ready. Too late. It'll be too late. We need to make preparation now to develop character. 
They said, oh, well, there's going to be some that's going to be called in. And if they can get ready, surely I can, brothers and sisters. Brothers and sisters, do you believe that this parable is not speaking to us? You speak this parable and these principles and, and the character can be developed in a moment? That we can especially ignore the evidence of God's spirit for so long and then in a moment switch back on our spiritual afterburners? We're almost done. TM, Testimonies of 233. Now is the time for care, the careless to arouse from their slumbers. Now is the time to entreat that souls shall not only hear the word of God, but without delay secure oil in their vessels with their lamps. That oil is the righteousness of Christ. It represents character. The character is not transferable. No man can secure it for another. Each must obtain for himself a character purified from every stain of sin. Now, 5 Testimony 136. Now is the time for God's people to show themselves true the principle. When the religion of Christ is most held in contempt, when his law is most despised, then should our seal be warmest and our courage and firmest the most unflinching. To stand in defense of truth and righteousness when the majority forsake us. Forsake us? That means they were with us before. When the majority forsake us? Well, uh, that means they must have been with us before. Who, according to the great country 6, always going to forsake us? The majority forsake us. To fight the battle of the Lord when champions are few. This will be our test. At this time, we must gather warmth from the cones of others, courage from their cowardice, loyalty from their treason. The nation will be on the side of the great liberal leader. You say, wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. Are you saying that there will be people that are part of the church that are going to commit treason and betray us and persecute us? Well, what would the Bible say? Then the Bible says in Matthew 25, Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins? It said it, didn't it, right? But we said that in the 24th chapter of Matthew, it shows us a people being raised up at a time when there's certain signs take place, and it gives certain other illustrations and prophecies concerning those last days. It talks about Noah, right? right. It talks about the fig tree. And it talks about what will happen at that last day when Jesus is soon to come. In Matthew 24, 25, we see ten virgins. Again, same period, represented by ten virgins. And it shows what will happen and what will be the situation of the people right before Jesus comes. The 25th chapter's last section and the 25th chapter's first section, did I say that right? The 24th chapter's last section and the 25th chapter's first section are parallels. One shows the signs of the time, the sun, moon, and stars. And then it shows these various illustrations, the parable of the fig tree, the time of Noah, and so on and so forth, to show exactly how these things would be like other periods of time and how we should be making preparation for that time. The 25th chapter comes and it says at this same time, God's liking the church parabolically unto ten virgins and show the idea of this advent, this tarrying time, and this final test for God's people. Now if we put these two together, when the last cry is made, right before Jesus comes, how many are wise and how many are foolish? Five are wise and five are in God's church. When those that are wise trim their lamps and go forward to meet the bridegroom, it says that the foolish do something. Notice what it says. Verse 8. We're in Matthew 25, verse 8. And the fool said unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are... It said what? Read, read it again. Read it loud. Verse 8. What's it say? And the foolish said... Read it together. Unto the wise, Give us of your oil, for our lamps are gone out. That sounds like a request. That sounds like a request. If your child came to you and said, Give me my allowance, for my allowance is gone. That sounds like maybe a little aggressive, maybe? Give us. Of your oil. For our lamps, these things are, are no good. Give us of your oil. Those, those that do not have the Spirit of God or the character or the restraining power of God, are they going to be kind and seeking the best interest of the wise at this time? Or as the wise are trying to get into position and follow this movement and go where the Master has them to go, then the foolish step into their way and say, hey, give us of your oil. Farms are going out. 
and says verse 9, but the wise answer saying, not so. Lest there be not enough for us and for you. But go ye rather them that sell and buy for your... What is it saying? Remember the third chapter of Revelation? The seventh, the seventh church? It says, I counsel the buy of me what? Gold, Gold trying to find. And white and which is what they needed to await and have a character that would be represented by or that oil that would develop character that it may be overcomers, repent, and sit upon God's throne. That's the third chapter of that's the message of the Lacian church. Go and buy. I can't give you this, and if I could, there'd be none for you and for because it's not transferable. But when you look at the words here, it says, and when they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went with, in, went with him to the marriage, and the door was shut. Brothers and sisters, when we look at this passage, in the 24th chapter, we see that what Great Controversy 608 says about the wise and foolish takes place. You said Great Controversy, Great Controversy 608 says that when the wise and foolish are, are manifested by the Sunday law issue and the storm is approaching, a great number of the people of God go to the other side. They abandon their position and they become opposers and aggressors toward their former brethren. And brothers and sisters, that spirit is even seen in this day. Whereas some people are starting to awaken and desire a great understanding of the truth of God and to follow God and to enter into this experience with God, some people want to stand in their way and say, hey, give us of that. Hey, what are you doing? What, what is that? Put that light out or give it to me. Notice what it says, Matthew 24. Matthew 24. Are we in Matthew 24? Yeah. In Matthew 24, the same thing we see in the 21st chapter of Matthew is parallel in the end of the 24th chapter. He likens all these symbols, all these situations, unto the last people, which also are the wise and foolish virgins. It says this, Matthew 24 and verse 42. It says, Watch ye therefore, for ye know not what hour your Lord doth come. Weren't they tarrying, watching for the Lord when they fell asleep? It says, Watch ye therefore, for you know not what hour your Lord to come. But know this, that if the good man of the house had known in what hour the thief would come, he would have what? Watch. He would have watched and would have not have suffered his house to be broken up. Therefore be ye also ready, for in such an hour as ye think not, the Son of Man cometh. Who is then a wise, a faithful, and wise servant? Do you see the word wise there? Who is wise? Don't, don't miss this connection between the two chapters, brother and sister. Who is then a faithful and wise servant? Servant, who in Revelation 7 received the Holy Spirit or the latter rain? The servants of God. It's end time application. Who is then a faithful and wise servant whom his Lord hath made ruler over his household to give them meat in due season or present truth? Blessed is that servant whom his Lord, when he cometh, shall find doing so or giving them present truth and understanding this truth, this message. Verse 47. But verily I say unto you that he shall make him ruler over his goods, all his goods, but if, sorry, but and if that evil servant, which is not wise, which would be what? If that evil servant is saying his heart, my Lord is tarrying. The Lord may not come for another hundred years. My Lord delayeth his coming. Let me just take a little nap until he comes. Let me just occupy in some sleep until he comes. And shall begin to do what? Smite his fellow servants in the church. And to eat and drink with the drunken. Or partake in the things of this world. A people unfaithful to their calling. That not only are partaking with the things and pleasures of this world. But in the same course turning to attack malign the character of disfellowship and be overly aggressive toward those that are wise servants that are faithful the Lord verse 50 of that servant shall come in a day when he looketh not for him and an hour that he is not aware of and shall cut him asunder and appoint him his portion with the hypocrites there shall be weeping and gnashing of trees there's going to be a chain brothers and sisters Look at me, change. Those that seem so zealous, if the Spirit of God finally leaves them, what will they turn to? Persecutors. Brothers and sisters, we see a tremendous situation. And this is not talking about them, this is talking about us. The Spirit of God can leave anyone. Ask Saul. Saul was anointed. Anyone here ever prophesy? I hope you don't say yeah. Anyone ever prophesy? Saul prophesied with the prophets. 
The same was is Saul, Saul among the prophets. Man was chosen by God, chosen by a prophet through the inspiration of God's power. This individual went into a Christless grave. This individual closed his earthly probation while he still lived. We must, brothers and sisters, understand that both the wise and foolish virgin all slumbered and slept. And all of us, even hearing this message, as long as this message may be played, are in those last two situations where we don't really see and understand with the full gravity, the prophetic implications upon us and upon the world. But soon and very soon, God is going to, even through this message, cause some stirring, convict the heart, cause to really see the great, great need that we have of awaking, awaking out of sleep, because it's high time to get where God would have us to be spiritually and help the world do so. Brothers and sisters, we can't continue to have these arguments in our homes, arguing with our spouses and our children. We can't do that. We have to overcome as a witness to each other and as a witness to our children, we must overcome. A witness to our neighbors. Think our neighbors don't hear us inside there act, crashing stuff and carrying on? You think not? Brothers and sisters, we need an experience that we can obtain to according to the word of God. Five were wise and five were foolish, but all slumbered and slept. What will you do with these words today, brothers and sisters? What will you do with these words? We allow God to do a work in your heart. We allow God to do a work in your heart. We allow God to give you an experience that you verily don't have right now. Character perfection. Character perfection. We may all have Bibles. We may all have come out from some message we've heard concerning the advent of Christ and are trying to make preparation in some type of way. But do we have oil in our lamps? Have we had the indwelling? Have we received the Holy Spirit as evidenced by fruit and works? By fruit and by gifts, by the power and the manifestation of the Spirit of God. Have we been changed? And dying daily, are we showing forth good works? Are we able to understand spiritually the things of God? Are we able to share these things with others? We're going to be slumbering and sleeping, brothers and sisters. But soon those that are dead in Christ, that especially heard the message and kept the Sabbath, given those people are going to come up the special resurrection and be a part of the final work those that are sleeping in the grave, that did not know, but were faithful in their generation, they're going to come up in the regular generation, or the regular res resurrection. They're going to come up, and they're going to meet the Lord in the air with those that are alive and remain. But brothers and sisters, if we're alive and remain, and we don't really attend, attend these prophecies and see where we are, and make a character change. Do you know the book Steps of Christ has steps in it? Do you know that? You know it's called Steps of Christ because there's steps in it. The steps, the step-by-step show you how to experience Renewal of heart and to keep it. That's what the book is called, Steps to Christ. It was one of the first books ever printed outside of the denomination. Ellen White didn't allow our denomination to print, print, to print it at first because she wanted this message to go to the world. God has given us a way, in the most simplest way, that we can be converted and saved. We can have that eye salve and that we can understand all these prophecies, all these principles, that we can be loving and kind. We can have the character of God. And we can be able to endure persecution, whether it come from within the church or without. But the way that we're dealing with persecution and the way people act and so on now, we're not ready. We're not ready. If people say things about us now and we're kind of ticked off, we're not ready. We need an experience that God is offering us. We must seek for the experience. The books that we've been given, the spirit of prophecy, show us the way. These sermons bless you, praise God if they do. But the books, 66 in here, and then a whole host in this last generation have been given to us that we may find the way into the bride chamber. Shall we trim our lamps? Shall we trim our lamps? Shall we get some oil in our vessels with our lamps? Shall we be ready? Let's pray together. Father, what more can we say? We pray that the Holy Spirit would do a work in our hearts and we will see truly that it's not all the various things that we tend to focus on. We want to focus, and many people focus, on the New World Order, the Jesuits, the Illuminati, the conference, the, the, the division, uh, the church. Man, there's so many different things that in themselves have some bearing and some true iniquity abounding, 
But brothers and sisters, if the love of God is waxing cold within us, we shall likewise perish. We need oil in our vessels with our lamps. We need an experience that we do not have. We need an experience that will cause us to be ready when that cry is made. And here we are at the end of time. All the signs are fulfilling. Where are we? For such a time as this, God is speaking to us today, even through this message, to make preparation to meet Jesus in peace, to make preparation for persecution within and without the church. When a storm of tempest breaks upon us, how shall we gather warmth from the cones of others when we don't understand the principles and power that will keep us in the hour of temptation? The Son of Man come when man thinketh not. Lord, help us to be ready because we have made preparation in our hearts by daily surrender to Thee. Taking that little book, Steps to Christ, and examining what those steps are, chapter by chapter, obeying the principles and the guidelines in that book that we may experience a new experience. Looking at Christ's oblique lessons that shows us that true experience and takes us point by point through a true experience. Looking at the law of God and the Sermon on the Mount. All these things, Lord, have been given for our sanctification, that we may have that eye cell and the prophecy may be made plain to us through spiritual eyes. Lord, while on others thou art calling, do not pass us by, is our prayer, and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.